So today I'm here on behalf of the authors to talk about some research we've been doing into disclosures of, of the results from clinical trials and looking at how the pharmaceutical industry is doing. So first I should acknowledge the authors um, and this was a study conducted partly by um, Oxford Pharmagenesis in conjunction with some of our um, clients at Shire. So they were Slavka Baranikova and Antonia Panayi, um, who were both at Shire, now part of Takeda. Um, Slavka has since gone on to work at Galapagos. Um, and the authors from Oxford Pharmagenesis were Jim Purvis, Eric Southam, Julie Bezo, and Chris Winchester. You see just their uh, disclosures and acknowledgements. Um, and I should say that the funding for this study was provided by Shire in combination with Oxford Pharmagenesis and employees of which reviewed and approved the draft text. So what were we looking at and why were we looking at this? We know that there is a perceived lack of transparency in the reporting of results from clinical trials. And this includes under-reporting of results and perhaps non-reportage of perhaps those results that didn't, from trials that didn't go we, the way we expected. This has the net effect of undermining confidence of healthcare professionals and patients in the conclusions drawn from those clinical trials, which is bad for us and bad for the pharmaceutical industry who invest so much money in making sure those clients, those trials run well. However, the issue of transparency is highly complex and diverse. We know that all clinical trial sponsors have an ethical obligation to register and disclose results. And in the USA, the EU, and in a number of other countries, certain types of trial must be registered and the results must be disclosed in dedicated registries. We also have other bodies, such as the World Health Organization and the ICMJE, who have issued transparency standards and recommendations. However, we do find that not all companies follow these. And for example, some biopharmaceutical companies disclose results in their own registries or websites. So there are a mix of methods that are followed. We know that the pharmaceutical industry groups promote transparency in the disclosure of clinical trial results. So FPA and pharma member companies have committed to a series of recommendations for responsible clinical trial disclosure. So what did we want to look at in this study? The objective of the study was to evaluate the disclosure of results of clinical trials sponsored by biopharmaceutical companies and compare those with the disclosure rates for non-industry funders. And this is the way we did this. So we use a tool called Trials Tracker. This is an independent, semi-automated, web-based tool um, developed, amongst others, by Anna Powell-Smith and Ben Goldacre. And what this tool does is it classes people as sponsors where they have registered more than 30 phase two to four clinical trials on clinicaltrials.gov. What happens with, the, with Trials Tracker is that it looks for um, summary statistics for clinical trials completed within, in our case, between January 2006 and April 2015. And what it looks for are the posting of the results on clinicaltrials.gov, looking for the um, specific tag ID for that, or publications on PubMed, looking for the NCT ID number. And then what we did was we calculated disclosure rates for clinical trial sponsors. And we categorised those as either industry sponsors or non-industry sponsors. So an industry sponsor was any pharmaceutical company, a biotechnology or generics um, or biosimilars manufacturer, or a company making medical devices. Examples of non-industry would be um, a charity or the National Institutes of Health in the US or a US federal grant, for example. The results for industry were further subdivided, so we looked at the top 50 biopharmaceutical companies and we classified those based on their global prescription sales in 2015. Um, and we also looked at whether they were members of FP or Pharma or not. So this is the inclusions in our trial. So overall we had just under 30,000 um, trials in total, covering more than 300 uh, institutions. When we divided those into industry and non-industry, we had nine and a half thousand trials from 69 um, industry sponsors and just under 20,000 trials from 254 non-industry sponsors. Breaking the industry sponsors down by whether they were in the top 50 or not, we had 30 of the top 50 sponsoring 6,179 trials. And if we look by whether they were members of FPR or Pharma, um, 25 of those were members and five were not accounting for 5,785 and 394 trials, respectively. 
The 20 top 50 biopharmaceutical companies that we didn't pick up in Trials Tracker, five of those are FPA or pharma members and 15 are not. So what did we find? We found that there was a sharp uptake in the proportion of trials with disclosed results between 2007 and 2008. And this coincided with the um, Food and Drug Administration Amendments Act 801, which made reporting of clinical trial results mandatory coming into effect. But then it tailed off over time after that. What we can see is if we look at all industry sponsors, they reached a peak of around 80% um, around 2008, and this was generally maintained until 2014. You see a similar trend for the top 50 and the FPA and pharma members. If we look at the non-industry sponsors, the trend follows that of sponsors overall. Now, there could be some explanations for some of this tail off. We know that there is a delay in the reporting of clinical trial results. Um, so there was a study by Thomson et al. in 2016, which showed that of non-industry or um, trials sponsored around Oxford and by a couple of societies, that um, just 25% of trials were published within um, 12 months and 33% within 24 months with the longest duration between completion and publication being 54 months. So we know there is a lag and that might explain some of this. But what we can say is that based on our results, the industry sponsors disclosed approximately three quarters of their trials, whereas non-industry sponsors di disclosed fewer than half of their trials. We can look at this in a slightly different way. So if we look at the relationship between the number of eligible trials versus the proportion of disclosed trials, we can see that we had a couple of industry sponsors who actually achieved 100% disclosure of their trials. There was also still one outlier who disclosed zero, so we're not saying industry is perfect by any stretch. Um, the highest disclosure rate for a non-industry sponsor was 84.4%, um, and this was the Veterans Affairs Office in the States. But if we look at the t those who disclosed 70%, 75% or over, 51% were from industry, 2% were from non-industry. And if we look at the other end of the scale of those who disclosed fewer than 50%, 14% of those were from industry, but 70% were from non-industry. So there are some strengths and limitations of this study, as you would expect. One of the key strengths is the fact that this, these results are based on a large number of studies, over 29,000 phase two to four studies and more than 300 sponsors over a 10 year period. However, there are some limitations. Using trials tracker means that we're not necessarily getting results that might have been posted on institutional websites or other registries. And we may have missed some trials if they weren't published, if they were published in PubMed without being attached to their NCT number. So if anything, we may be perhaps underestimating the degree of disclosure. But in, disc in conclusion, industry sponsors disclosed approximately three quarters of their clinical trials compared with less than half for non-industry sponsors over the same period, both clearly have room for improvement. And we can clearly see there was a sharp increase between 2006-2008. The disclosure rate for industry plateaued around 70%, whereas that for non-industry sponsors declined from 2009 to 2015. Thank you.